This podcast is brought to you by the Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation. Are you looking to support your memory and optimize your quality of life? Develop a healthy brain for brighter days at PNI's Lifestyle Program, available virtually and in person. Reserve your spot today. Visit PacificLifestyle.org to learn more. Hello, this is Anthony Effinger. I'm the host of the Think Neuro podcast at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. And today I'm talking with Dr. Amit Kochar. He's an otolaryngologist, a head and neck and facial plastic surgeon, and he's the director of the Facial Nerve Disorders Program at the Pacific Head and Neck Institute at PNI. Dr. Kochar, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So today you have uh, something interesting you'd like to talk about. Yeah, today we'd like to discuss uh, synkinesis, which is a spectrum of facial nerve disorders uh, related to having had facial paralysis at one point. Um, And the cause of synkinesis is still unknown, but eventually what happens for patients who have facial paralysis, whether it's from um, Bell's palsy, Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, could be Lyme disease, could be from traumatic injury during surgery or from a trauma, from a, head, from a fall, or from a removal of a tumor. Um, if you have injury to the nerve or uh, no movement of the facial muscles for a significant amount of time, usually about two to three months before the nerve starts to regenerate, patients will develop abnormal facial movement. Uh, and this can be a big problem. Problem. While their face is still moving and they've quote unquote recovered, they're unable to control the movements. And so patients uh, will come to our practice, to the Institute uh, for help for, for treatment of that. So let's break down the Greek terminology or synkinesis. Kinesis is movement and syn implies some irregularity, correct? Correct. Okay. And it's a, um, it can be caused by many different things. That which you just talked about. So tell me about the kind of people who arrive in your clinic with this condition. The most common cause of this is a man or woman uh, who has developed Bell's palsy. And in most cases of Bell's palsy, which is inflammation of the facial nerve, uh, it will recover within one to two weeks after the proper treatment, which is usually some type of uh, antivirals and a mixture of high dose steroids. And for those patients, 90% of them will recover with minimal irregular movement. But about 10% of those patients can take one, two, three months to have even an inkling of movement. And in those patients, they can experience abnormal recovery. And so over time, the muscles become hyperactive so that they're always on. And that can contribute to a feeling of tightness in different parts of the face, even when there's no movement that we can see perceptively as observers. It can also cause uh, unwanted movement. So when you smile, your eye may shut. When you're trying to smile, you're, you can't control, you can't keep your eye open. Or when you blink, your corner of your mouth may pull every time you blink. And for the uh, person experiencing that, it can be very troubling. Uh, It can cause them a lot of distractions when they're trying to convey thoughts to others when they're speaking um, or when they're, you know, just trying to take photographs, for instance, something as simple as taking a photograph can become an extremely anxiety provoking event. Yeah. You know, my mother-in-law had Bell's palsy for a pretty long time and she got it from Lyme disease. Mm. Have you seen that cause? It's very rare. Um, I've seen two causes. Uh, both patients made full recoveries uh, pretty quickly, so they didn't develop synkinesis in those cases. But uh, it is it is one of the known uh, contributors, and it can actually cause bilateral facial paralysis in some patients. Meaning both sides are affected. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, she just had one side. Um, why do antivirals work? I, I was thinking antivirals, I can understand how they'd work for Bell's palsy 
in the case of Lyme disease, though now I'm wondering if that's a, uh, a virus or not. But why do antivirals work for Bell's palsy? Well, Bell's palsy, uh, so first and foremost, so, so Lyme disease is caused by a uh, bacteria, Borrelia right. or Borrelia. So it's not a, a totally virus. different, but if you develop Bell's palsy, quote unquote, Bell, a real Bell's palsy, um, it's believed to be caused by reactivation of the herpes virus. And so herpes simplex one is um, endemic and we probably have all had a mouth sore from time to time. And typically that's related to the herpes virus. Now, whether or not you have active mouth sores or whether or not they're, um, uh, you know, whether or not you have them at this time has no bearing on whether or not you'll develop Bell's palsy. In a small subset of the population, uh, that uh, virus has now entered the nerve that's in your mouth related to the facial nerve um, around the mouth, around the tongue. And then the virus actually travels back along the nerve over time. And if for some reason you have a moment of immunosuppression, high level of stress, um, something can happen to reactivate the virus. Um, if the, if the nerve gets inflamed at any point along the track, the nerve will expand. And so you can have pain and discomfort in your tongue and your cheek. Um, but when it gets to the point behind the ear, the bone can ex or the nerve can expand because it lives in a tunnel of bone. Now, when that tunnel of bone has a nerve inside it that wants to expand and be inflamed, the bone actually functions to crush the nerve. And so when it crushes the nerve back here, all of the output is turned off. And so the virus causes the nerve to inflame, the nerve gets crushed by the bone, and then everything on the face will stop working. And it's usually within a 12 to 24 hour period. Now to go back to your question, why does the antiviral help? Well, it is a virus we're treating, but the antivirals have never been proven to reduce the longevity of the Bell's palsy or reduce the inflammation. They've actually been found to be more helpful in preventing post-herpetic neuralgia or a syndrome of pain that can arise in these patients afterwards. If you think about how painful the mouth sores are when you have them in your mouth, Imagine if you had those tracking along the nerve and in the cheek Ooh. and in your, in your tongue. And so it can cause exquisite facial pain and discomfort. And so we believe that when patients get uh, antiviral, it can actually help prevent that, usually within the first 72 hours or three days. What really helps to reduce the inflammation of the nerve and we believe helps to improve outcomes is giving patients high dose steroid treatments. Mm. And those treatments um, are usually in pill form. Sometimes if the patient's not hospitalized in IV form, but usually tablets and they'll take um, several, they'll do a taper where they'll start on a high dose, maybe 40 or 60 milligrams, and then go down slowly. Now, there are some new therapies that are out there for patients who have acute onset Bell's palsy or Ramsey-Hunt syndrome that are very exciting. Wait, what uh, was the second thing you said? Bell's palsy and what syndrome? Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. And what's that? Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is slightly different from Bell's palsy because it's a, instead of a reactivation of the herpes virus, it's a reactivation of the uh, herpes zoster. And so zoster is the virus that causes chicken pox. And so it's a, it's the same phenomenon that occurs, but more severe. And so patients who develop that uh, are more likely to develop synkinesis, to be honest, because they have more severe injury to the facial nerve. Okay, so the same mechanism, two different viruses. Two different viruses and typically two different outcomes in terms of severity. So um, a new option for therapy uh, is using IVIG or immunoglobulin. And that is something that is being tested at several uh, university medical centers. And hopefully within the next six to 12 months, we'll have some data to support using that for patients with acute facial paralysis known to be caused by Bell's palsy or Ramsey hunt. Um, I don't know too much about it in terms of if it'll be available to the mass population or if you'll have to go to be hospitalized to receive the therapy, but there's some interesting work being done in that, in that arena. When you say immunoglobulin, I think of gamma globulin, which was something way back in the day you used to get before you traveled to exotic places. Are we talking about the same sort of thing here? 
No, uh, IVIG, it'd be more like um, what we're trying to do for patients with COVID. So when they were giving them like a synthetic immunoglobulin that would help to uh, offset the activity of the virus itself. Okay. So you, so these are things that you have in your arsenal. When does this, when does um, synkinesia become a surgical issue? Well, that's a great question. So typically what will happen is, is a patient will develop Bell's palsy or uh, Ramsey hunt. They'll recover. If it takes, you know, three to six months for them to start regaining movement, usually within a few months after that, by, you know, eight or nine months from the initial insult, they'll start to develop some sort of asymmetry in the face, or they'll start to notice the signs of the synkinesis, the unwanted movement, the inability to smile fully, even though they have recovered, um, and tightness, things like that. In my practice, I want to have had the patient typically be about a year from their initial recovery before we talk about surgery. In that year, I've usually attempted uh, to have them work with a physical therapist to do facial retraining exercises to help release the tension and work on specific trigger points. We've also embarked on using Botox or um, uh, botulinum toxin injections to help turn off the muscles that are reacting abnormally. And if they meet certain criteria, basically the severity of the disease is um, unable to be improved fully with the Botox and the physical therapy alone, that's when we start to think about surgical options. So usually about um, 12 to 18 months after the initial experience of the Bell's palsy was when we would start to talk about surgery. Because a lot of patients will get better with physical therapy and chemo denervation using Botox or ZMN or one of the other disport, one of the other medications that we have. Um, and I'd say that the surgery really is for that last 10 or 15% of patients that can't uh, seem to get better. Or for, for instance, maybe they have an aversion in needles and they can't, you know, they can't, they can't undergo the injections for whatever reason. And so in that, in that allotment of patients, we'll start to discuss surgical options. Okay. So these 10%, you watch them for 12 to 18 months, or you're, you're trying every, you're trying lots of different things. And then what does the surgery look like? Well, a surgery that we perform now for synchronesis can take a couple different forms. Uh, we know that the nerves are not acting properly. So the muscles want to work, but the muscles are actually the endpoint. So they just respond to nervous input. So they're, they're basically, if you think about the, um, you know, something in your home, a light. Okay. So the uh, light will turn on and off based on the switch that you, you, you push in your kitchen or in your garage or in your family room. But what happens in synkinesis is instead of turning on the light in the kitchen, when you want to turn on the light in the kitchen, when you turn on the kitchen light, the garage door opens, <laughs> or when you want to turn on the TV, uh, the light in the kitchen turns on or when you want to turn on the light in the, um, in the bathroom, uh, the toilet flushes. So those are the types of things that can happen, even though it's all coming from one place, different activities occur. And so I use that, I use that metaphor to try to tell patients what we're going to do is we're going to go into your face and we'll map out all the different branches of the facial nerve. And then we use a tiny little electrical stimulator and we watch the face in response to stimulation of different nerves, different branches. And we know based on our research, which branches should activate which muscles. I know which light switch turns on the kitchen light. I know, know which light switch turns on the family room. I know which light switch turns on the garage light. And because of that, I can say, well, if I stimulate a nerve and a movement happens that isn't supposed to, I know that nerve is not acting properly. So I don't, cut it immediately. What I'll do is I will um, tag it. I'll put a little uh, suture around it to know that I've marked that one as a not good one. And then I'll go and I'll march up and look at all the nerves. And so we'll see all the ones that are acting properly and all the ones that are acting improperly. And now a message from our sponsor. The Think Neuro podcast is brought to you by Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation, a nonprofit 501c3 organization. 
If you're inspired by what you hear and wish to support our mission of education through innovation, please visit pacificneuro.org slash foundation. Can you describe where you're um, doing this, where you're mapping on the face and where, and you're actually putting a suture. A suture or a, a, a little rubber, rubber, um, uh, vessel loop there. It's hard to describe. There are these little, uh, instruments we use that they don't actually, they don't, they don't, they just basically putting like string around it just to tag it so that we know where we don't. Inside? Yeah. So we'll make the incision here on the side of the face and maybe a little bit behind the ear, almost like a facelift. And then we lift the skin and then the prodded gland lives right here in the cheek and in we basically, cheek. yeah, underneath the skin. And then we will, um, dissect out the nerve through here. And so basically we lift the skin up to here so that when we can map out the nerve branches, we can see on the patient's face while they're asleep, different parts of the face, twitching, smiling, so frowning, things like that. You're pointing to your parts of your cheek and near your eye for the folks who aren't seeing this on video. Um, but it's basically originating behind your ear and spreading out across your cheek. And you're, and, and those are yeah. the branches you're, you're tagging. And the ones that don't aren't, you can tell are not working properly. You tag and say, this is what we have to fix. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I think in our early experience, we were obviously afraid we didn't want to take away too many nerves. And so we would remove five or seven. Um, and in some cases we've had to go back and revise those cases where we've, we realized that we just didn't remove enough of the nerves and then that we can take out more. And the reason for that is our face is very special. And so our face has evolved over millions of years and evolution has allowed us as humans to have many, many branches of the facial nerve that can do the same thing. Hmm. Basically we have redundancy. And so, you know, the joke, the joke or the common joke that lots of patients is, you know, if you were a caveman or a cave woman, you know, if, if you were gotten in a fight or you were, you know, trying to, you know, someone had attacked you at that point, you didn't have the surgical ability to fix your face, but if they attacked you somewhere in front of your eye, a line from your eye to the angle of your mandible, if they attacked you somewhere out here on the front of your cheek, there's many, many other branches that if a nerve was injured can make up for that. Hmm. And so it's the same thing back here, there's many branches that do the same thing. And so we just have to find the ones that aren't working properly. So in some cases you can take 10 or 12 facial nerve branches and the person can wake up with still totally normal function. Um, and so that's, that's a, that's, that's part of the solution. So that's called selective neurolysis where you're going in and you're selectively cutting or neurolysing specific nerves or neurorectomy. Yeah. The other procedure that we often do at the same time is um, we'll go in and we'll cut some muscles that are not functioning properly. So the platysma muscle is the muscle that goes from your collarbone and it wraps the neck and it goes all the way to the jaw and kind of comes just over the jaw. And patients with synchronesis can have significant tightness in this area. Every time they smile, every time they pout, every time they chew, every time they close their eye, you can see really tight bands in this neck. And so we know that there's a nerve that controls it, but that nerve alone doesn't just turn the muscle off. So in some cases we'll make a cut in the nerve or in the muscle, sorry, and we'll take out a little wedge of it so that it can relax hmm. and it won't be so tight. We can do the same thing in the mouth. There's a muscle called the depressor anguli oris muscle. And so that is a uh, incision we can make inside the mouth. We don't have to make an incision outside and we can go and we can actually cut that muscle and that can help to elevate when that muscle is overactive. It just ends up pulling down the corner of the mouth and not allowing patients to smile. So we can go in and cut that. So it's a combination depending on the patient of muscle only removal, uh, nerve removals or a combination of the two. You know, it's tempting to think that the um, redundant innervation of the face speaks to some evolutionary benefit to having a very expressive face. Does that make any sense? It makes great sense. It's exactly right. And so uh, Charles Darwin um, in his treatise um, discussed that exact topic. And so what he noticed, not just for humans, but in other species, uh, conveyance of emotion 
and the ability not just to convey emotion, not just my ability to smile and convey happiness, but your ability to respond to that. And so if you can't have a symmetric face and show that you're acknowledging somebody, they're going to go and find another mate. They're going to go and find another person to communicate with. If they can't interpret your response to what they're saying, they're going to say, okay, well, sorry, Anthony, uh, I guess you're not having a good day today. And they're going to go talk to someone else. And so, but, and that happens in all species, not just the human species. Interesting. So evolution has favored these, the, this structure and has put considerable energy into exactly. Um, exactly. maintaining this. That's fascinating. And for people who are suffering with synkinesia, it's great because there's alternatives. There's, there's options when something goes wrong. Exactly. And, I, you know, what I try to, what I actually, so when a patient comes in with synkinesis for the first time, it's really um, an educational process for me to explain to them. So patients will come in, they've just been paralyzed on their face for two to three months. They started to regain re- recovery, their hopes are up, they're very excited. And then for some reason, that recovery paused, you know, they were able to elevate the corner of their mouth, you know, one millimeter every day, two millimeters, three millimeters, and then it just stopped. Mm. And the other side of their face can move move fine. And then slowly over time, they start to notice that their eyes blinking a lot more uncontrolled, that they think they have spasms, or that their cheeks are tight, or their neck is tight. And so they come come to me and I say, well, when did you start to develop recovery? And they'll say, uh, Ahmed, I, I'm not recovered. I've never recovered. And so I have to explain to them the, the meaning of recovery is different. So the meaning of recovery to me means when did you start to have the nerve, you know, wake up again? When did you notice a little bit of movement? But the meaning for recovery for them is a, a complete smile. And so we have to really explain to them that you know, your nerve is recovered. It's actually recovered too much. It's working all the time as opposed to only when you want it to work. And it's really tough for patients to um, comprehend that because they've just spent the last, you know, nine months living with a face that they think is totally, you know, flawed and not, and not recovered at all. And so once I get over that hump of letting them know that they're on the road to recovery, They've just, you know, they've just had this abnormal development and that we need to work out the kinks. We need to work out the knots and in like literal sense, they need to go to a therapist and have someone massage their face and relax their facial muscles. And they need to have someone inject them with medication to try to turn these muscles off. Uh, We can start to really make some breakthroughs. Yeah. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's got to be a little confusing. Did you say that these, this condition often comes on very suddenly? Yeah. And so it's usually pretty quick and that's what helps to uh, helps us as physicians know that it is a Bell's palsy and not a a tumor of some sort. Uh, And so if let's say uh, today's a Tuesday, we're chatting on a Tuesday, let's say over the The weekend, I felt a little down. I thought I had a fever. I wasn't feeling good. You know, I was just really worn out. I had some pain behind my ear and some tingling in my mouth. I went to bed on Saturday night, and then I woke up Sunday morning to go to the bathroom. And I realized, you know, I was trying to brush my teeth, and water wouldn't stay in my mouth. That's a story we hear all the time. Wow. Patient goes to sleep. They wake up. They don't really pay much attention. Uh, Then they look in the mirror, and they're like, whoa, something's wrong. And so... You know, when it happens within, you know, overnight or over a few hours or one or two days, we lean towards a Bell's palsy. Now, let's say a different story. Let's say, you know, um, three months ago, I noticed that every time I got in the shower, more soap was getting in my left eye. I, I was, you know, it was closing, but it just wasn't closing as tight. And then about a month ago or two months ago, I noticed that my smile was a little weaker And then, you know, yesterday I suddenly couldn't smile. So that's like a three month onset. That's something where I'm thinking, okay, this is slow. This is gradual. This is not Bell's palsy. This is something more concerning in the sense that, you know, I want to, I think it might be a tumor or a cancer that's causing the nerve to slowly uh, lose function. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be alarming for somebody to 
you know, wake up one day with, you know, a malfunctioning set of facial muscles, as you said, because the face is so important. I mean, this has got to be a shock. It certainly is. And I think for that reason, you know, a lot of patients will go straight to the emergency room as they should. They need to rule out stroke. They need to rule out other causes. And so, you know, it's really up to the emergency room doctor or the urgent care physician in a lot of these cases to make the initial diagnosis and prescribe the medications. Uh, Typically, patients don't come to our office for just Bell's palsy. They'll either go to their primary doctor or one of the emergency rooms. And, you know, we really get involved after they've started to develop function or if it's been two to three months and there has been no function. And then we start to really kind of tease apart, you know, was this really Bell's palsy? Tell me the story again. Um, you know, have you had any imaging, you know, now that it's been some time, how were you treated? Can we do anything else to see? And then sometimes, you know, unfortunately we will diagnose a, a cancer that may or may not have been, you know, easily identified at the beginning. Um, and in most times though, it's really just the Bell's palsy or Ramsey hunt. That's just taking a long time to recover. When you do encounter a tumor, you, you treat that you that's in your wheelhouse, right? Certainly. Yeah. So, um, yes. And so depending on the area, you know, we'll be doing, um, if it's a skin cancer related or a parotid tumor, we'll remove that. Um, and usually in those cases, when we encounter a patient who has facial paralysis and there's a tumor, the good news is we can, um, use nerve grafts and re reconnect the branches that are cut if we have to remove them. Because usually when the nerve is not working related to a tumor, it means the nerve has been infiltrated with cancer or with a tumor and the nerve has to go. In that case, what we'll do is we'll harvest uh, nerve grafts from other parts of the body, maybe from the leg, from the arm or from the neck, which we usually use for sensory input. So they'll have some numbness in those parts of the body where we take them from, but they're perfectly suited to reconnect the wiring in the face. And those patients can potentially get recovery within two to three months after their original surgery. Some of the terminology you used um, sounds like you are a very, very high-end electrician. (laughs) Essentially, that's what I, it's funny that you mentioned that, but I will say that, you know, I use these metaphors of the light switch in the house. And I often will talk about the electrical uh, company and things like that to try to really explain it to patients. Um, but really what it is, is nerves are electrical wires and, but they're unique to you. So every, you can't go to the hardware store and get a new electrical wire to put back in. You really have to use the ones that your body provides. And that's what, you know, my job is to say, Hey, look, you know, I'm going to, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul is one of my mentors used to say. Um, and we'll have to make some sacrifices. You know, we may not have sensation on the lateral aspect of your leg, but we're going to be able to recreate your smile and we're going to be okay with that. And if you're not okay with that, then that's fine. Um, and we have to come up with another solution. When you talk about taking nerve nerves from another part of the body and, uh, replacing nerves in the face that have been damaged, what scale are we talking about? What sizes of nerves and other, you know, structures are we talking about there? So I'd say the width is usually about two to three millimeters, maybe four millimeters in width. The length can range. In some cases, we're taking 14, 15 centimeters because we want to go from one side of the face to the other. Um, In some cases, we're just looking for seven or eight centimeters. It really varies. It all depends on the patient, but we can get a significant amount of length. And what is the, what does, what is the consistency of a nerve? What is its, you know, what does it feel like? Is it like string? Is it like a rubber band? Is it Um, it probably feels more like pasta, (laughs) like spaghetti. It's fairly, I'd say it's, um, al dente. I think I I'd say, you know, I think the, um, it's not going to be, it's not raw pasta. If you get it from the grocery store, it's probably closer to a almost cooked. Um, but essentially what it is, is it's not one string. What usually will happen is there's a bundle and there'll be one, two, three, four, several different in there. And so my job is to, line them up by on the outside that bundle is wrapped in a in in a sheet and i will use these sutures that are smaller than a human hair and we'll sew sew a couple around and we'll really line them up and so then we'll just let them rest there and so um then over the healing process let's say this is where the, the the start is and this is where the end point is that distance 
you know, the data suggests that it grows about a millimeter a day once it's starting to heal to go through. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, very, very smart people who've done research into this. We've tr tried to use cadaver grafts in patients where we don't want to remove their own tumors. Um, and they found that those work with some success. There's some concern that there could be additional scarring because that tissue has been radiated. So it doesn't have, um, it doesn't mm. have immune cells. Um, so I usually prefer to use the, my own patient's uh, tissue if I can. Um, you know, there's different glues, there's different suturing materials, there's wraps that are supposed to have stem cell properties. Um, a lot of different things you can try, but at the end of the day, it's really, you know, how well do you get the ends together and, you know, how well, you know, and then the patient has to heal. Um, in some cases, patients, you know, will experience radiation after these surgeries to, so that they have to remove a tumor, but in other cases, we don't. And this is different from the synkinesis surgery. The synkinesis surgery, I'm cutting the nerves. I don't want them to grow back. Mm. So in those mm -hmm. cases, we'll cut the nerve, we'll cut it, and we'll try to like take it back a little bit because they'll actually, they send out these signals. They send out the, these um, uh, neurokines and express signals to try to find each other. And so it's real. the body is an incredible thing. You know, you go in and you're trying to fix it and the body's like, what are you doing? And like, I am fixed. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ruin the surgery that you did. And so you have to, you know, you have to be really thoughtful about some of the things that you're, you're trying to attempt to do. Certainly. Are you doing all of these surgeries under magnification of some kind? Yes. Yeah. So, um, for the, for the main parts, you know, I'd say 90% of the surgery is done under loop magnification, two and a half to three and a half um, times. But then once we do the actual suturing of the nerves, uh, we're using a microscope. And so that can go up to eight, nine, 10, 10 X magnification. Yeah. And how long is it? One of these surgeries usually take, say one where you're trying to reconnect, uh, nerves with, with a graft. The actual reconnecting of the nerve probably takes less than an hour, you know, hmm. putting it, putting the nerves together, but you know, it's that the surgeries can have many different pieces of a puzzle or parts of an orchestra. You have your, uh, cancer surgeons removing a tumor. You have your, my, you know, reconstructive surgeons like myself harvesting graphs and putting things together. So I'd say on average, you know, it's a six, seven hour surgery mm. when you're, when it's all done. Um, but if it's just, you know, the synchinesis surgeries, when you're going in and you're removing different branches, that can probably be done in three to four hours. Um, and, you know, patients can go home the same day. for mm. those. Mm. That's great. That's great. So last couple of questions. How did you, uh, how did you come to specialize in, in, facial nerves and facial surgeries? Well, you know, I, um, I did my training in laryngology, had neck surgery. Uh, and during my training at Johns Hopkins, I had the great pleasure of, you know, getting to be mentored by one of the giants in this field, Dr. Patrick Byrne and Dr. Kofi Bohene, um, among others. And the, the procedures that they were doing, you know, trying to, trying to help people's faces move again, really spoke to me. You know, I, um, I knew I wanted to go into plastic surgery of the face, uh, and I really enjoyed doing, you know, the bread and butter, the rhinoplasty, the facelifts and things like that. But there was something about being able to do these incredible nerve transfers and uh, nerve reconstructions um, and seeing the seeing the outcomes. Uh, and, it, and it fits well with my personality. My uh, my college roommate used to call me the, the king of delayed gratification because I was constantly studying for tests and preparing for the next, preparing for the next big thing. And when you do these surgeries, you really are waiting. You know, it is a waiting game. The first thing I tell patients is, Hey, look, we're going to be friends for a long, long time. I'm going <laughs> to operate on you and you're not going to see a result for four to six months. And you're just going to have to trust me. Um, and, you know, luckily knock on wood, I've been right most of the time, but um, it really is one of those procedures that, you know, you learn from, um, you see the result, you wait four to six months, you judge it, and then you think about, okay, how can I make the next one better? And, uh, it's a, it's a great, it's a great, it's, it's a great field. It's a very, um, gratifying to work with patients like this. Oh yeah. And it's incredibly challenging, which I also enjoy. No, I'm sure. How long was your training? Uh, my residency training was seven years and then another year of, uh, fellowships about eight years. And where did you do your fellowship? I did my fellowship at UCLA. Okay. Here in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was more 
towards microvascular reconstruction, less on the facial nerve side. Um, that was more for head and neck cancer reconstruction and kind of your bread and butter facial plastics. But the most of the facial reanimation and the nerve work was all um, gained from my time at Johns Hopkins. Oh, fantastic. Um, well, Dr. Kochar, this is great. I, um, it's fascinating to me. Um, there's so much going on in the face. And as you say, even, you know, Charles Darwin knew years ago, centuries ago, uh, that this was an important structure and, um, it's fascinating. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us about it. Well, thank you guys for having me. This is yeah. great. And, um, yeah, I'm excited to be a part of Pacific Neuroscience Institute. It's been uh, about a year year and a half that I've been here and we are doing some incredible things and I love being a part of this team and taking care of our patients. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.